Amen. Please be seated. Church, we're really blessed to have Pastor Andrew come in to bring the Word with us this morning. I want to actually pray before Andrew speaks this morning. Um, as you're probably aware, um, there is really devastating drought affecting much of the east coast of Australia. We actually had some requests come through from regions. You can come over, Andrew, from regions from um, Stanthorpe and Warwick, particularly just some requests came through. We've got Cody, one of our interns, is actually from Warwick. They're on severe water restrictions there. Stanthorpe's been affected as well. Andrew is a Stanthorpe boy. So I thought, what a good time just to pray, ask God to come and bring rain to these regions and pray for Andrew as he comes to bring God's Word to us. Will you join with me, church? Prayer is powerful as we join our hearts together now. So why don't we pray, ask God to bless. Yeah. Oh Lord, we are very aware of the devastating impact that these, this drought has been having, Lord, in so many regional areas of our nation. And we want to come, Lord, and we want to ask you, great God, we want to pray, Lord, that you will bring rain to these regions, Lord. Particularly, we pray for these requests that have come through, particularly from Warwick and Stanthorpe, but beyond that as well, Lord. But with Andrew here, Lord, many of his family living up there in Stanthorpe, uh, we pray, Lord, that you will bring rain, that they will see, Lord, answers to prayer, that you'll re bring relief here, we ask, Lord, and that everyone will know, Lord, people will see as we pray, as we seek you, that this is a blessing from you, Lord, as they've seen before, I know in these regions. Do it again, we pray. So we ask this. And now, Lord, as Andrew comes to bring your word to us, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Andrew, Lord, what a blessing he is to us as a church. We just pray for your blessing over him now. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, can we give a really big welcome to Andrew as he comes to share the word with us? Oh, thanks, Nathan. That was nice uh, to pray for those regions and understanding what they're going through at the moment, uh, some of the hardships and troubles of life. It's interesting, actually. Growing up on a farm and watching my parents live out their faith through many trials and challenges uh, that the weather particularly, um, yeah, the challenge that, that it can um, bring in farming, whether that be hail or drought, but um, it's actually probably quite pertinent as we think of today's topic as I, as I share with you um, on suffering here this morning. Uh, this morning we continue as we look at God's Word in this series in First Peter. I hope you're really enjoying it. I I've loved the sermons and the weekly studies we're doing in First Peter. But one thing I've recognized, and particularly listening to the sermons last week, is that the teaching that Peter gives is actually countercultural or unnatural to us at times. Did, did you feel that last week? The, the sense that Peter says, "Love and bless your enemies." Don't retaliate, don't repay evil for evil or insult with insult, but love your enemies. It's a teaching that goes against our natural desires. And even this week I've spoken to people that have been really challenged by those words and are looking to, to I guess, follow that in their lives and in their businesses and in their relationships. And ah, even this week there's testimonies of how that truth has impacted their business and their lives. Because when, when, when someone expects evil for evil, and when they then experience love, grace, and forgiveness, people or the world or those we interact with actually see something of God. They see something of his character. And similarly, as we look at the topic of suffering here this morning, there's a similar sense that the response to suffering that we find in this passage is, is not normal, but it's actually powerful, and in that, God is seen and witnessed. Now, to start off, I'd like just to put up a definition of suffering there. Uh, it's a state of undergoing pain, distress, or hardship. Now, the reality is, even as you look at that definition, no one of us wants to suffer. No one is looking forward to suffer. In fact, I actually think that each one of us does our best to completely avoid suffering in our life. That would be a normal thing. We're fearful of suffering. Yet the reality is that no matter who we are in life, we all suffer in various ways to various degrees. And as hard as I might try... We cannot, or I cannot, avoid suffering. And I'm very aware, even as I speak this morning, that some of you know deep suffering. I even imagine Diane and Paulie and the family's life there, that there's suffering in that journey. And some of you even now are suffering. 
It might be the loss of a loved one, broken relationships, illness. And I'm very aware of that as I speak here this morning on this topic. Others of us may not be suffering in such a critical way at this moment, but we need to be prepared for suffering. What do we make of suffering if in the future there we come across it? Right from the outset, I want to be very sensitive to the suffering that people are experiencing. Even in preparing this this week, there's four to five people I interacted with this week that I know are going through deep suffering. It, it, it is part of our life and our experience. But I do want to say that God's Word can give us confidence in the midst of suffering. It does give us hope and make a difference. His presence makes a difference in our circumstances and suffering. And even as we read this passage, I think it's really helpful to realize that um, Peter, the author of this letter, uh, went through considerable suffering himself. He was persecuted for his faith. He was beaten. He was imprisoned. And eventually, he hung upside down on a cross, martyred for his faith. So Peter knew something of suffering as he wrote this. In the context of the letter, the people he was writing through, they were undergoing persecution under the Emperor Nero, uh, which we've heard a little bit of in the previous weeks. Imprisonment, beating, like brutality, wild animals being fed to wild animals, all sorts of suffering that Christians were experiencing at this time. And as Peter writes to these uh, believers, he calls them beloved. There's There's a loving heart extended towards them as we read this passage here in 1 Peter 12 to 19. Peter writes, he says, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted, Because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. For the spirit of the glory of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. For it is time for judgment to begin with God's household and it begins with us. That what will be the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves into their faithful creator, to their faithful creator, and continue to do good. There's God's word for us today. And as we look at this, we can ask the question. How do I respond to suffering? And in this passage, Peter gives his readers four specific responses to suffering. The first one, do not be surprised by suffering. Secondly, surprisingly, to rejoice in suffering. Third, to prayerfully consider your suffering And fourthly, to trust God in the midst of that suffering. They're the four things that we're going to look at this morning. The first thing is, do not be surprised by your suffering. In verse 12, he says, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. I remember when I made the decision to follow Jesus. There were some hard years leading up to that that brought me to Jesus. But there was, whether subconsciously or even consciously, I thought in that moment that as I came to Christ, God was now on my side, so everything would be sweet. It would be just smooth sailing. But it wasn't long before I realized that that wasn't the case, that I too suffered, I too had trials and challenges, even if God was on my side. But we do live in a culture or a society that today that is, is geared towards our, our um, comfort and our ease. So many things in life are geared towards that comfort and ease. I might sit on my couch and beside me will be this remote that I can point at the TV so I don't have to get out of my comfortable lounge chair 
to change the TV. Once we had to go and get up and press a button, but now it's all sweet. In our houses, we now have air conditioning and heating, and we can set that to the temperature we would like that we would be comfortable. Even better than that now, you can have your house set up in a way that on your iPhone, you know that you're 15 minutes from home, you can log into your iPhone, change the temperature, and make sure your house is being heated or cooled to the temperature that you want to walk into. It's set up for our comfort. Now we have phones and the internet at the fingertips, and even if Telstra or some other carrier is down for just a few moments, we're up in arms because it's not available to us. We have insurance policies to protect our income that if anything was to happen to us, we could still live the life that we are comfortable with. We also have a medical system, which I'm very thankful for, to help us and serve us at any moment. And obviously, none of these things are bad, are they? None of these things are bad. As I said, I'm certainly thankful for the medical help that I've supported and particularly for the anaesthetist that put me to sleep while I had an operation on my hand to save me from that pain and suffering. But what I want to illustrate here is that we live in a culture that does all that it can to keep us comfortable and to avoid suffering at all costs. Paul Tripp speaks of this mindset when he shared the following illustration. He says, if I could design my normal week and set it according to my agenda that I would experience this week over and over again, there would be no suffering in it. Actually, there would be no difficulty at all. I wouldn't plan anything that would get in my way. Everyone would applaud my presence. My body would be fit. I'd be completely healthy. My stomach would be full, and I'd have a mind that is always entertained. And we expect life to be like this that it would be hassle-free, and when trials and hardship or suffering come into our lives, they might feel abnormal, and we can be shaken. I mean, what have I done wrong in this instance if I'm suffering? What is God doing? And again, these are normal questions. But Peter in this passage is saying, when trials come across your path, don't be shocked. Don't be surprised at all, but actually you can expect these trials. As Christians, we we are to have a different perspective in the world. In the beginning of this chapter, in verse 1, Peter tells his readers, actually, be prepared for trials and suffering, and actually arm yourself with the attitude of Christ. As Christians, we can expect suffering to be part of our experience, because while it wasn't God's original purpose, when we go back to the Garden of Eden, there was no suffering, there was no sin. God was with Adam and Eve perfectly and intimately. It wasn't God's original intention. But with sin and the fall, it resulted in broken, brokenness and suffering that has penetrated the world in every area. Whether it be in our relationships, in creation, natural disasters, disease, Brokenness has led to suffering within humanity. And while within us there is this innate longing for eternity, for heaven, where there will be no suffering, there will be no tears, there will be no death, in the midst of this short time that we're here on earth, Peter is saying there will be suffering. Don't be shocked, don't be surprised, actually be prepared for it. And greater than that, not only will there be suffering, but God is working within that suffering to test. It says that these trials have come into our lo- the believers that he's, he's speaking to to test them. These fiery trials were being used by God to prove the genuineness of their faith and to refine and strengthen their faith. We read that in 1 Peter 1, 6-7. Peter writes, in all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes, even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed." 
It's like a refining is happening, happening through these trials. Many times the scriptures speak of God refining us like gold or silver. It's a great picture of the way that God works in our hearts. There was once a, a Bible study group of, of ladies that were looking at this theme when they came across the, the verse in Micah. It says, He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify them and refine them, meaning us, like silver and gold. This verse puzzled the group as to what was meant, and one of the ladies determined to research the refining of silver. She met with a silversmith, not mentioning the reason of her interest, but asking if he could explain to her the process of refining silver. He graciously obliged, demonstrating and teaching her the process. He first held the silver over the fire, and he let it heat up, and slowly the dross and the impurities rose to the surface, and they were taken out. He continued to take the silver in and out of the hottest part of the flame, waiting for the impurities to rise to the surface, slowly purifying the silver. She thought of her verse again, reflecting on God sitting as a refiner, and asked if it was, it was true that he had to sit in front of the fire throughout the whole process. Yes, not only did he have to sit, but he could never, ever take his eyes off the silver, watching it closely that it would never, ever get too hot and be destroyed. And finally, the woman asked, when do you know when the silver is fully refined? That's easy, he replied, when I can see my image reflected in it. What a beautiful illustration of what God does in our lives through trials. God is in intricately at work in those trials and he doesn't take his eyes off us for one moment, carefully purifying us that we might reflect his image. The refiner's fire, it, it never destroys indiscriminately. It doesn't consume completely, but it refines it purifies and it separates those impurities. The Bible teaches that God has a bigger agenda in mind than my comfort. He loves me too much, he loves us too much to leave us unchanged. But on the other side of suffering is a refinement in our life. The possibility of greater intimacy with him to show the world what Jesus looks like in us. So the first response Peter gives his readers here is to do not be surprised that you will experience suffering, as if it's strange, but no, God is at work within it. The second thing we notice in this passage, which is the, the surprising one, is that he says rejoice in suffering. Crazy, isn't it? When you think of what they were experiencing, here he is saying rejoice. When I read something like that, I think there must be something in that for us. How can he encourage them to rejoice in suffering? Let me read that verse, verse 13 and 14. But rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be, you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. For the spirit of, of glory and of God rests on you. In the midst of severe persecution and suffering, it seems crazy for Peter to be telling them to rejoice. But as we read the New Testament, we see this is actually not something that is uncommon. We read the account of Peter himself, he's dragged before the Sanhedrin, the religious leaders of the time, he's, he's beaten and then they're sent away after this flogging, and there he leaves rejoicing. And Paul and Silas, we read this passage in, uh, in, in Acts where they're beaten and flogged and they're thrown in prison, and yet there we find them rejoicing and singing praises to God. So what do we make of this? It's either some crazy idea or crazy expectation that Paul has on them that they should be rejoicing in their suffering, or there is something here for us that someone or something is at work in a greater way, that you can actually rejoice in a moment of suffering. 
There's actually two things that we find in this passage. The first is that rejoice in the suffering so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. So Peter here is giving this eternal perspective. When, when Jesus' glory is fully revealed, have an eternal perspective. And as I read earlier, Peter says, though you suffer for a little while, there's this knowledge that it's not going to go on forever. It's actually a short period before eternity. Karen Jobes, a commentator on this passage, says, The Christian who stands fast and suffers for the gospel is responding to an eternal reality that will outlast death. It will actually outlast history itself. The joy prompted by recognizing this is just a foretaste of the joys that Christians will experience when the glory of God is fully revealed. Despite suffering, these these followers of Jesus can have great hope that the suffering will be for a little while and then heaven awaits them in eternity. Sometimes I pray, there's this this funny prayer that God brings back to me. It's like, Jesus, in in a hundred years' time, (laughs) I picture where I will be, worshipping with God in the presence of all the saints, worshipping him in a place where there's no more suffering, there's no more pain, that's where I will be. But now for a little while, there will be suffering, there will be trials. But in this moment, Peter's saying, that's, that's, that's where your home is. That's what I've created you for, that relationship with God. No more pain, no more suffering, but for a little while, you will feel like strangers here on earth. You will feel the suffering, but he says, keep that eternal perspective. Johnny Erickson Tata was a a very active teenager, but the age of 17, she had a, a diving accident and became a paraplegic. Reflecting on her regular times of physical affliction and and, and pain, Johnny reflects, saying, In that moment, a moment of pain, I sat and I dreamed what I've dreamed of a thousand times, the hope of heaven. I recited 1 Corinthians 15, that the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable. I mentally rehearsed a flood of other promises and I fixed the eyes of my heart on the divine fulfillments. That was all that I needed. I opened my, my eyes and I said out loud, come quickly, Lord Jesus. This experience often occurs two or three times a week for me. Physical, physical affliction and emotional pain are frankly part of my daily routine. But these hardships are God's way of helping me to get my mind on the hereafter. And I don't mean the hereafter as if it's a death wish a psychological crutch, or an escape from reality. I mean that this is the true reality. And looking down on my problems from heaven's perspectives, trials look extraordinarily different, she said. When viewed from below, my paralysis seems like a huge, impossible wall, impassable wall. But when viewed from above, this wall appears just like a thin line, something that can be overcome. As it it is, I've discovered with delight the bird's eye view found in Isaiah 40, 31. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow faint. They will walk and not be faint. Eagles overcome the lower law of gravity by the higher law of flight, she says. And what is true for birds is true For my soul. If you want to see heaven's horizons, all you need to do is stretch your wings like the wall that becomes a thin line, you're able to get to see the other side. That's what happened to me that day in my office. I was able to look beyond my wall to see where Jesus was taking me on my spiritual journey. Scripture represents us with an eternal perspective. I like to call it the end of time view. This view separates what is transitory from what is lasting. What is transitory, such as my physical pain, will not endure. But what is lasting, such as the eternal weight of glory accrued from the pain, that will remain forever, she writes. 
she gains hope and strength from God in looking at that eternal perspective. The second reason that we can rejoice uh, that we find in this passage is that in verse 14 we read that the spirit of God of glory and of God rests on you. It's really important that we recognize this. this. This is an amazing statement that in that place the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit comes and rests on you. We would be mistaken to think that to rejoice in the midst of suffering was a matter of just grinning and bearing it, being strong-willed in our own strength. No, this is countercultural because it is a supernatural intervention of God. How could one ever rejoice in suffering if it wasn't for the intervention of God in that moment? God meets and empowers his people and the Holy Spirit rests on them. You may have heard of Corrie Ten Boom. Uh, she grew up in, in Holland and her family were rescuing Jews in, uh, in the war and she ended up finding herself in a Nazi concentration camp and suffered there. But she shares this story that when she was a little girl, she had this conversation with her father when she was questioning or very worried or anxious that if she ever had to, would she have the strength to hold on to her faith and not deny Jesus if she was to come to, in the hands of the Nazis. And her father gave us, her this really good illustration. He said to her, when you are going to take a journey on the train, do I give you your ticket three weeks early or do I just give it to you just before you get on the train? She answered, you give it to me just as I get on the train. So her father said, so God will give you the special strength that you need to be strong in the face of death just when you need it and not before. 1 Peter 4, 14 promises that in the hour of great trial, God would, will come to his children by his spirit to give courage, to give strength and faith in the way that we may never have thought possible. And Corrie Ten Boom experienced that in the concentration camps in years ahead. In 2007, you might remember a story when 23 Korean missionaries were captured by the Taliban as they travelled across Afghanistan. After gathering them, uh, they threatened to kill all of the hostages one by one and began this negotiation with South Korea. But as they gathered together, uh, one of the guys that survived this, a pastor, shared that as the 23 of them gathered together, each of them went round the circle, knowing what was before them or knowing the possibility of what was before them, and they spent the moments in prayer committing themselves to the Lord. Lord, whatever you want with our lives, they prayed, we will, we will accept and one lady there had a portion or a Bible and she broke it into 23 different portions and handed it out amongst the others because they were going to be separated. Sadly, two of them uh, were killed, but after negotiations with the Korean government, the other 21 were rescued and this pastor shared some of his experiences. What he said was rather interesting was that individually... The other 20 that experienced this came to him at different points in time, not, not all of them, but some of them came to him at different points of time and said to him, Pastor, don't you wish that we were still there? When I was in the pit, by my surra myself surrounded by the Taliban, I felt so close to Jesus. I experienced in that moment intimacy with Jesus that I've never, ever experienced before in my comfort. Pastor, don't you wish that you were there? What an amazing statement these people were making, that I would rather be in the midst of the trial, in the midst of that persecution, because of the intimacy and the experience that I had of God in that moment that sharing in his suffering and experiencing him in the midst of it is actually better than my comfort, that Jesus is better than anything else this world can offer, they were saying. 
So what am I saying here? I'm, I'm not saying that we should head across to Afghanistan and find ourselves in these positions or even look for opportunities to suffer. But what I'm saying is that in that place of suffering, when God does call us to places that make us uncomfortable, when he calls us to honour him in places where we might be rejected, we might be insulted, we might be standing for his name, God will meet us in that place. Just as Cory ten Boom's father said, like in that moment you will experience the grace of God that you need. And there is nothing better, nothing more precious in this world than experiencing intimacy with Jesus. And that often, that often comes in places of trials and suffering. And that's why as we look at that eternal perspective and the Holy Spirit coming upon us that there is this sense that even in the midst of suffering we can rejoice. The third response as we work through these four that Peter gives is to prayerfully consider their suffering. While I acknowledge this morning that it, it is so hard to understand suffering, suffering, like I mean it is a wrestle to understand suffering. Peter here does encourage his readers to prayerfully consider three things that may be causing suffering. In verse 15, he says, If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or as a thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. One preacher I listened to said here, You, you should ask your question, Am I being an idiot? <laughs> Is that, is that why I'm suffering here? Because I'm either a murderer or a thief or a criminal or a meddler, and that's why I'm suffering. And after listening that, to that sermon, I reflected on some of the suffering in my life, <laughs> and I found that often it is caused by my own stupidity, my own poor decisions, my own sin can cause suffering in my life. And Peter's saying, consider that. Prayerfully consider that. Is there something that's happening? And even in the midst, even for these believers, even if you're the minority, even if you're being persecuted, don't, don't, don't make suffering worse for yourself by meddling in things or, or making it harder for your, your, yourself. Um, still be honorable, be gentle in the way that you um, treat people and respectful. But that the way you live will not cause problems. And if it is our own sin, we, we come to Jesus and we ask for forgiveness of that. We ask him to come and change us in that moment. And in verse 16, the second reason, it says, However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be afraid, but praise God that you bear his name. So there's a sense of if you are rejected, if you are insulted or reviled because of the way you live in your society, don't be ashamed, but see it as an honor to bear his name. As you live for him, rather than the approval of others, his name will be lifted up. Jesus said in John 15, 20, No servant is greater than their master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. So if you identify with Christ, there may be suffering that comes from that. And thirdly, in verse 17, it says, The third reason that one might uh, suffer, Peter gives, is either judgment or discipline. If we read 17, it says, For it is time for judgment to begin with God's household. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do, do not obey the gospel? Now, this is a surprising verse. I don't know if you've ever thought of it. Time for judgment to begin on God's household. Judgment actually coming on believers. We, we, we see judgment as a head. And uh, this is not saying that there is eternal judgment for believers. Let me uh, clarify that, that there is no condemnation in Jesus. It's not eternal judgment that he's speaking of, but he's speaking of this, uh, this process of purifying the church that happens in this moment. It's a purifying or a pruning process. Actually, Jesus speaks of it in, in John 15, 1 to 2. When he speaks of the vine, he says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that will be even more fruitful. So some of our suffering or the refining is not because we've done anything wrong. It's not even because we're, we're, we're aligning ourselves with Jesus. It's, it's just that we're in this refining process, this pruning process. Even those that bear fruit, 
he will prune that they will become even more fruitful. It leads to great int- greater intimacy and fruitfulness. As Nathan said, I, I grew up on a farm in Stanthorpe, 100 acres there where, where Dad had uh, lots of apricot trees, lots of plum trees, lots of pear trees. And the job for winter, and you can imagine winter in Stanthorpe, the job for winter was pruning. That whole period of winter, like months, Dad would be out there pruning trees. With, can you imagine the cost of that, the time that would take to prune these trees. Now, why did he do that? He, he did that every year because he knew that as he pruned those trees back, that they would be more fruitful the next year. It wasn't comfortable for him, and I'm sure the tree took a hit that some of them were really cut back hard. It would have been easier to leave them, but he knew that if there wasn't a pruning process, there would be no fruit. Actually, sometimes... Sometimes there would be, a, like either a tree would be forgotten or sometimes he had these different varieties that he was testing and he would just give up on them, wouldn't even bother pruning them. What you would find is that they would be full of foliage, they would be full of green leaves and full of long branches, but in the season when fruit was meant to come, there would be no fruit because everything within the plant was given to these branches and the leaves, but there's no fruit. The pruning led to greater intimacy or greater fruitfulness. And for us, it means greater intimacy with God and in the end, greater fruitfulness in our lives. And Brother Yun was a a church leader of the underground church in China. And he shares this story of of pruning in his life. As, As a teenager, he came to Christ and he immediately started sharing the gospel with others. And he found that people in China at that stage where he was had such a hunger to hear about Jesus and to know about Jesus. And within one year, 3,000 people became Christians. But after a few years, the government authorities had clamped down on the church, and before too long, Brother Yun found himself in prison, locked up and cruelly treated. And he could not understand what God was doing. This must be some type of mistake, he said. What have I done wrong? What is God doing? Had God forsaken him? But in crying out to God, he soon realized that this was all part of God's plan and that God wanted to continue to spread the good news now with thousands of prisoners that were desperate to hear of God's love and grace. God was still working in the midst of his suffering. And Brother Yun reflected on this attitude and the transformation in his mind as he understood what God was doing and rather than feel resentment, he was full of praise and joy for for what God was doing. So the third encouragement we're given is prayerfully consider what God is doing in suffering. And verse uh, verse 19 says, "So So then those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. The word here used for commit is committing or entrusting oneself into God's hands. It's actually a banking term. Although there wasn't banks in those days, in Peter's days, if you had lots of money and you were about to go on a trip, you would entrust that money, you would commit that money to a family member or a friend to look after while you were away. And as you would do that, of course, you would entrust it to someone with integrity, someone you could trust. And here in the midst of suffering, Peter is saying, in the midst of your suffering... Entrust your life into God's hands, for he is your faithful creator. He is someone that you can trust. He is a God who loves you, a God who is faithful to you, a God who is good for you, to you, even in the midst of suffering. And we see this in Jesus' life as he was heading towards the cross. The night before Jesus is about to go to the cross, you have this moment in the Garden of Gethsemane where he recognizes the suffering that's before him and he says to God, to his Father, he says, please take this cup from me. Take it away. I don't, I, I don't want it. I'm not going to enjoy this suffering. But not my will. Yours be done, Jesus said. And that's the, the attitude in, in verse 1 of this chapter, 
that we're encouraged to have, to have the attitude of Christ in the midst of our suffering. God, I may not understand it, but I trust you. God, I don't like it, (laughs) but I'm drawing close to you. Don't be surprised by suffering. (laughs) Lean into God that you might experience his spirit in the midst of suffering. Don't try and escape suffering, but prayerfully ask God the question, what are you doing in the midst of my suffering? And don't try and deal with it in your own strength, but commit yourself to God in the midst of that suffering. I found this uh, uh, quote as I was researching this that I thought summarised this this passage really well. C.H. Spurgeon said the following... He said, I have learnt to kiss the wave that throws me against the rock of ages. I'll just invite the band up, but I'll just read that one more more time. I have learnt to kiss the wave that throws me against the rock of ages. In our suffering, in the the trials of life, may that May they draw us closer to God, that we might experience his love and grace in that moment. Would you stand with me as we pray and ask God to meet us in those places? Well, Jesus, I want to thank you that firstly you are a God who is familiar with suffering. And Lord, I want to pray for each one, as I said at the very beginning, Lord, sensitive that that all of us suffer in various ways, but there are some who suffer deeply. And Lord, now I want to pray that the Holy Spirit would rest on them. That actually, Lord, you would meet each of us in the trials of life that you would encourage us and help us to keep our eyes fixed on you. And that, Lord, you would find a people that are willing to submit to you and to work with you in the deep work that you may be doing in our lives. And, Lord, we just want to acknowledge in that 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 you are love, that you are good, that you are a Father who loves us deeply. And, Lord, I just pray for each one that they might experience that even this week, your faithfulness in the challenges and trials that they are facing. And Lord, would you lead us in these trials to look more like you, but Lord, we pray that there would be more fruitfulness in our lives, that those around us would see you more clearly as we walk through suffering, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. I'm just going to continue to worship now. This is a song that speaks of God's faithfulness, that he is faithful even as we continue to come back to him. Let's worship together now. Oh, Lord, we thank you for that, that great truth, that you are faithful to all your promises, great God, that we can trust you. And I too want to pray, Lord, for those who are in the midst of the trials and challenges and sufferings of this life, Lord, that right now that you'll meet them by your very Holy Spirit, your presence here in this place, strengthen, Lord. Help us to stand firm in the midst of that, knowing, Lord, that through it comes, Lord, incredible blessing and glory to you, Lord Jesus, and in our own lives as well, great God. And so we pray this. I pray a blessing on each one here, Lord. I know there's many, Lord. The reality of the world in which we live, the reality of life, Lord. But thank you that you meet us in that place. Thank you, Lord, for these promises we have today. And so we pray for your blessing, Lord. And we pray again, Lord, that you will use us. Lord, refine us and use us to be the light shining, this blessing, this truth, this hope to our world this very week, we pray. And we ask this now in Jesus' mighty and powerful name. And everyone said, amen. Please be seated. If you'd like prayer, some of our prayer team will be down the front. They'd love just to pray for you after our service. Also, don't forget tea and coffee in the courtyard. Do feel free to stay with us as we greet you and welcome you today as well. But God bless. Thanks so much for sharing.